This is PJ Souls, and you are totally listening to Without Your Head Horror Radio. Hey guys, this is Tom Matthews, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Stay tuned. All right, and we're back once again, and now we are joined by the writer, the producer, the co-director, and he's also the co-star of Brutal. We have Michael Patrick Stevens on the line. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you, Neil? I'm doing. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yeah. Now, first of all, I, I went over this. The writer, the producer, the co-director, co-star. Well, why did you decide to be so involved? Yeah, it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what all the titles? Of, yeah, well, more out of necessity than anything. Um, you know, I wrote the script, and I wanted this to be my directing debut uh, because I had written a couple other scripts I had offers on. Uh, with much higher budgets, but they wouldn't let me direct because I hadn't directed before. So I simply just wanted to uh, do a lower-budget film uh, that I could direct and show everybody what I did. So, you know, writing, directing, and I ended up producing it so that I could make sure that, you know, I, I worked with the people that I wanted and uh, put my crew together, and off we went. So I, I actually did not plan on playing Brutal, my friend Steve Whitaker, who wrote the title song, uh, This Thing That I've Become, which plays during the trailer and at the end credits, uh, and he did a fabulous job, by the way. Uh, he's a bodybuilder, and I, a natural bodybuilder, and I was going to have him play Brutal. He's got a really deep voice, just, you know, just a, a, an intimidating presence, taller than I am, and uh, and I'm six foot three, so he's six four, uh, but about a week before he couldn't get get the time off of work so and everybody had been saying ah you should do it you should do it but i just wanted to focus on on my directing because that's where my real passion is uh but i did find as we were going through the process that uh i i enjoyed acting quite a bit um you know i mean i'm 43 years old i've been a foster parent for 15 years i don't have any you know ego to uh you know, Phil, so I wasn't trying to write, produce, direct, act, who it's about me. I just wanted to make my film the way that I mm -hmm. wanted to make it uh, and, and, and not have all the stipulations that had been put on me before, um, not directing, being one, and, and also changing a lot of my story. Uh, you know, I didn't want to go for that. So anyway, that's how I ended up doing it all. Um, wouldn't recommend it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would what would you say was the hardest role of all those, or just the fact that you were doing all those things? Um, it, yeah, it's a combination of everything. Um, I would not suggest, and, and a lot of people told me not to uh, co-direct. If you're going to do it, bite the bullet, do it yourself. Uh, I didn't want to mess up my first film and. Uh, but it, 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 that's very difficult. So if you want to go for your your own complete vision, then you need to do absolutely do it yourself. Um, the, the whole thing was very difficult. It was it was a complete whirlwind, as I'm sure you can imagine. From the moment I had the idea for the script, I realized after my fourth deal that I was not going to get you know the five to twelve million dollar budgets I had been offered before to do my other script, The Haunted Caves, and its sequel, Savvy Island, um, you know, which had been a graphic novel and, and, and done really well at Comic-Con, and um, I just, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that, so, um, you know, I just went forward and put everybody together, but the moment I had the idea, I pitched it, got the money, had to write the script in 21 days, took me 23, so I was two days behind, uh, put everything together off of Facebook. Hadn't met a one person, and that's why I met Michael Baldwin and everybody else. The only person that I did know prior was Alan. So it was, I was thrilled he was on board, and, and Michael had been a childhood hero of mine from Phantasm. So having those two on my, my corner gave me a lot of confidence. But, you know, from the moment I had the concept to writing the script to getting the crew together to, the, you know, the shoot being done was three months and one week. Uh, and I, I think that's got to be some kind of record. You know, yeah. I'm not sure, but that's pretty fast for a feature film, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, who, who did this? Who did like the makeup and the special effects? Because I thought they were all really well done. Oh, Christina, uh, Christine, sorry, uh, Cordum, 
Mm-hmm. She is, uh, also does the special effects on the TV show Grimm. She was absolutely fantastic. You know, I mean, obviously professionally, because like you just commented, the, her, her work was incredible. Completely sold, uh, the brutality and the reality of the film. Um, and on top of that, she was just a wonderful person. We all fell in love with her. She made you feel good all day. And, you know, that's quoting Michael Baldwin, and I couldn't agree with him more. Um, she, she was a fabulous, fabulous person to have on set, and I'm, I'm just so grateful that she was there mm-hmm. um, and plan on working with her again. So, wonderful, wonderful lady. Now, did, you get, did you get into contact with her on Facebook, too, or is it someone uh, you knew? Um, I had contacted her, but my co-producer, Kent Luttrell, who had, um, he had contacted her, and the co-director had contacted her. Kent knew her because he had done some work on Grimm, too. So all three of us were going at her from different angles. And she just finally came on board like two or three days before the film um, because she was so swamped and so in demand. And then there were two days she had her assistants there. She couldn't be there, uh, but, you know, left perfect instructions and, uh, so I, I just thank God she came through at the last second because we were we would have really been in a pinch and it would have been a completely different movie. Mm-hmm. You said you originally had someone else, uh, you know, in mind to uh, to play uh, the, the part you did, Brutal. Uh, did uh, the did the role change at all when you took over it, or since you kind of wrote it, maybe you kind of thought maybe you would play it at some point? Or uh, well, I had originally, uh, you know, had him being this muscle bound you know, individual like Steve, Mm -hmm. and I am, you know, I have a lot more girth (laughs) than Steve, so uh, so I went and, uh, you know, so, you know, the the costume in my mind changed, yes, uh, because I wasn't going to put the audience through seeing me, uh, you know, with my shirt off or partial shirt off with the overalls and all that, so uh, that did change a little bit, yes, visually. Mm -hmm. Uh, Annabelle, do you have a question? Um, sorry, you keep catching me off guard, man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, well, along your line, uh, did, did you always have the clear mask uh, picked out? Because I, I like that. I actually used, used to have masks like that when I was a kid. No, I've actually got a bunch of pictures. Um, we went through a whole bunch of different masks. Um, bought quite a few of them. Was trying to come up with something unique and original. And then again, that was the co-director, Darla Ray. We had talked about, uh, you know, having a clear mask or a porcelain mask. It was my idea to have the partial mask. So she found the whole mask, and I cut, you know, had him cut the bottom out. But, uh, you know, we, we were trying different things, some industrial masks, you know, some that hadn't been done before that would be memorable, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of have a, a, like a, like a twisted, which is what I think came off great with that clear mask. You just, you know, also like kind of stalking somebody's twisted features also represents kind of their twisted soul. Mm-hmm. So I was really happy with that in the end. Now, you know, all the different uh, torture devices and things, were these all things you thought of when you were writing it or were some of it like in your mind, you know, throughout the years that if you ever got a chance to make a movie or whatnot, you'd like to include this? No, no, that, that all just came up in the last second. Um, uh, except for the potato peeler. Um, that has been in my mind for a number of years because I've never seen anybody use a potato peeler on somebody in a movie. So, uh, yeah. I was wondering because a hobby of mine is to sit around and think of different uh, torture devices. So, you know. Oh, well, no, that's, you know, I'm really not a, a horror film person. I love the first Halloween. You know, mm-hmm. there's not one drop of blood in it because it's just a fabulous movie. I don't even really consider it a horror film. And then the original Phantasm, which if everybody focuses on the yellow blood and the fingers getting cut off and the sphere sucking the blood out of the guy's head. I, what I always related to was the relationship between the two brothers, you know, which to me was the heart of the movie. And Michael Baldwin was the heart of that relationship. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so to me, there was a, a much deeper meaning there. So, um, uh, but when I was decided I needed to do a low budget, um, I, you know, it's like, okay, what costs money? You know, locations and, yeah, you know, I mean, certainly time shooting. So I'm like, well, if I can keep it mostly in a basement, 
But then how do you keep that interesting? How do you, you know, have the dialogue between two people last so long? And I like twists and turns, and I don't like just flat-out slasher movies. So to me, it had to be unique and original. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, in my opinion, I'm very pleased with what I came up with so quickly and so happy that everybody responded so well to it. Mm-hmm. Nope. I was awfully, I was awfully nervous, let me tell you. I mean, I sent it to Michael Baldwin, and he's like, you know, I've read so many scripts, and it's hard for me to get past page 10, so I'm just sitting there kind of sweating <laughs> it out, you know, uh-huh. uh, hoping he'll do it and hoping, uh, you know, he would want to get on board. And, you know, he wrote me and said he couldn't put it down, and it was great, and he sent me a few notes, uh, which were very good. But, you know, I mean, for basically a, a first draft that went almost to a shooting script, it was a... Uh, uh, I'm very proud of it. Mm-hmm. What's that like for you, though? I mean, you you were a childhood fan of the movie, grew up really liking it. Then you you actually get you know the the, the star, the lead of uh, Phantasm in this movie that you you found your first movie you get to make. I mean, what's that like whole process and to see it actually you know come to be? Well, it was so real to me. I mean, I'll tell you when I when I first you know I mean I, I don't get starstruck. I've I've, I've, I've worked with developmentally disabled children, survivors of abuse. I've seen the ugliest thing, you know, life has to offer. So I can switch hats real quick, though. So, you know, on one hand, when you just look at him as a human being and you talk to him, that's fine. Like, we're friends now. I talk to him and uh, no problem. But then when I put my phantasm hat on, you know, I get, same with Alan, the Halloween, you know, I'm like, blah, 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 you know, I'm just <laughs> blown away. So um, especially phantasm because, you know, I I I had a, a came from a broken home and a tough childhood, and I found that movie at the exact moment that I needed to, and I drew a lot of strength off of that character. And you know, we all have movies in one way or another that we relate to that way. And I literally, you know, in my own personal life, borrowed a lot of things from that film uh, to strengthen myself and to get through certain situations. And uh, you know, so. I have a much more in-depth relationship with that character than probably normal. And we don't know how things from childhood impact us and stay with us. So then getting to know him and then realizing he's not that character, uh, it took me a little bit to separate the two, but not very long. And, uh, you know, getting to know him, the person. Uh, but I'll tell you, when I put in the friend request on Facebook, uh, I don't get like this with many people. I was sitting there for about three days, you know, and I'm like, is he going to answer? Is he going to answer? And, boy, when he did, I felt like I'd won the lottery. And that was just to become his friend. So then I I, I just thought, I'm going to go for it. So I typed him an email and just told him what the movie and he had meant to me um, and what I did for a living so I wasn't a kook because I, I had no doubt he'd run into a few of those. Um, and he wrote me back and was really appreciative and, and, and like the fact that I had a more in-depth uh, feeling towards the film and his character, and we hit it off right away. Um, and it, it was really nice. So while I'm standing there in front of him, I mean, to go through that process, to then have him read my script, to then have him agree to do my film, uh, it, it was just, just one unbelievable thing to me after another. And Phantasm and Halloween, in my opinion, are the two horror films that set the standards in 78, 79, although in 60 there was Psycho, of course. But I had two people, you know, involved in these two franchises that were my childhood heroes because I'm also a musician and I totally related with Alan on another level. And here they are working on my first film. I just, I couldn't, uh, it was it was really a joy, you know. And then I had some real moments where I was totally myself and, and into the job and being professional, but then just for a moment, I'd be like, I'm about to do a take with Michael Baldwin, you know. <laughs> I just was like, oh, over the moon, you know. But then I was worried I was going to hurt him. So I, it, was really, it was really surreal because, you know, my hands were all full of blood, and I, you know, have a sander a half an inch from his leg, and it's slipping, and the same thing with, you know. A lot of the a lot of the things that that could have go wrong gone wrong, and thank goodness they didn't. Uh, but it, it was it was unbelievable to me. I, it, it was I'll never forget the experience, and I'm just so grateful. You said you had the sander, and you could have gone. Was it like a, a live sander? 
I, it was live, man. <laughs> Everything was live. <laughs> Everything was live. And when I, you know, I don't want to give away too much of the movie, uh-huh. but when I hit him in the face, we did a take where obviously he just broke with it and I didn't hit him. And it, it just, it didn't work. We played it back. We looked at it. It just didn't work. So he said, okay, all right, go ahead and hit me. Give me about 30%. Don't knock out any teeth and I'll break with it. So when I hit him, I mean, that's a real smack. And he, he took it like a champ. And of course, in the movie, it just looks like I'm this ferocious monster pounded on this guy. And the whole time I'm sitting there worried I'm going to hurt him. So, you know, I, I have a completely different experience watching the film, obviously, than anybody else will. Mm-hmm. Uh, Annabelle, do you have a question? Yeah, um, you mentioned that you're not really a horror guy, um, yeah. but you were compelled to make this movie. Where do you, did you make this movie hoping it would kind of launch you so you can get into some other filmmaking projects? Because it's it's obvious that you're really passionate about getting into filmmaking. So where are you hoping this will go? Yes, well, my, my, like I said, the, I, I had four deals to make my previous script, The Haunted Cave and the sequel, Sabi Island. And, and those are my babies and... Um, I, I just, uh, I'm a very good collaborator, but I'm mm-hmm. just not into people that want to, you know, destroy my vision. If you're on board with me and you want to add to it, that's great. Basically, I wrote them to be PG-13. Um, I wrote them for my best friend, so there's a lot of personal meaning there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was born deformed and handicapped, and he did not have a wheelchair until he was 14. Oh, wow. so I carried him everywhere. Wow. So, uh, yeah, and our favorite thing to do was to go through the haunted cave, haunted house, um, every year in Hillsboro, Oregon, and I'd carry him through it. So um, I love, like, the silence of the lamb, mm-hmm. and that's horrific. You know, you're cutting off people's faces, you're, you're gutting people, but I don't consider that a horror film. Mm-hmm. Same with Halloween, same with Phantasm, because there's so much character depth. I guess I should say I'm not a slasher film person. Yeah. Um, I'm fine. I'm fine with blood and guts, but I like intrigue. I like mystery. Um, and, and the haunted cage is full of that. So, you know, again, just being a closet writer and being mm-hmm. up in Beaverton, Oregon with all these foster kids, uh, you know, Rick almost died. my best friend. So I wrote mm-hmm. it for him. Obviously the tie in is that was our haunted house. And I just thought, you know, how fantastic a movie would this make. I wanted to try and keep him going um, because we always, you know, when we were younger, they could touch you. Now nobody touches you because of the yeah. law. But if, if you didn't come out with a bloody nose or a black eye, you didn't have a good time. <laughs> and, and I mean, we just, we, we got, you know, the piss pounded out of us and we loved <laughs> every minute of it. So uh, anyway, that, that, so again, there's, there's blood and guts and mayhem in my other films. But there's no sex scene. There's a lot of character development. If you read my Fairnet review about the graphic novel on my website, they were very, very impressed on the, the depth of character development, more so than in these types of movies. And to me, that's true horror. You know, the camera pans over. Two people are having sex in a car. Uh, she rolls off them. They light a joint. Jason steps out or whoever. I don't know mm-hmm. if I can name anybody, but they kill them, and I personally don't really care because I don't know who they are. Yeah. But if you spend time with people and you get to know them, then by the time they get stuck in a dangerous situation, you're mortified because yeah. you that's true terror. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that I like. So yeah. that's yeah. what I wrote, and everybody responded extremely well to it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so so... I guess I'm not a slasher movie type of person, but they, you know, a couple people were like, oh, you've got to put sex scenes in this. That's the proven formula. Mm-hmm. That would not work. It would be totally out of character yeah. uh, with these people in the situation. Not that they're crude, not that they're boring, but they mm-hmm. just didn't have a place in the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and Fearnet totally, totally got that and that review uh, you know, I was very pleased with because, you know, they understood what I was going for. Yeah, some real so. psychological depth. Yeah. Yes. And I'm not really sure I want to see the uh, little sex scene between you and Michael Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I had I had written uh, for him to be strapped in the chair naked, 
And that, you know, you wouldn't have seen his private parts or anything. Mm -hmm. But to me, that would even make him more vulnerable. And, uh, you know, and and he was like, I'm not getting naked. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you know what? In the end, it ended up it ended up being better because he would have had to do that and be naked, and that would have been a little bit weird. So, I mean, the, the guy is my childhood hero. Now he's one of my super duper great friends. Mm-hmm. But to me, the grossest part of the movie, just mm-hmm. one other little thing I'll give away, uh, was was nothing to do with the blood and guts. Uh, we shared a drink out of the same bottle, so. When he was, you know, desperately trying to get some water, when I was holding it up to him, you know, just being the character, his tongue went in the bottle. So I had to drink after him, and I, I almost didn't make it, but I got through the <laughs> shot. So that was kind of a germaphobe. So to me, that, that's the most horrific part of the most movie. You know? I love you, Michael. I love you, but I don't want to swap spit with you, man. Uh, <laughs> you know? I, I don't want to give away... Uh the big twist of the movie or any or anything like that but um i actually watched it a second time today and like a lot of movies that have twists it's uh, really interesting to watch a second time because you get to pick up on a lot of uh little hints at that things that happen later on and uh different when you know what happens and then you watch it again you can pick up on on things that you put in earlier in the film and i think it's really interesting well, yeah, I, you know, I wanted it to be, I mean, I want to do my own thing originally. I don't want to be compared to anybody, but I, I will say it's like, you know, I mean, let's say the sixth sense where you yeah. go back and watch it, the even though it's club. not like oh. sixth sense. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Fight club. Good example. It's a completely different movie. The second time around, yeah, completely yeah. different. It's like when you know how a magic you know. trick works. And right, then you right. see so, how it's revealed and how the how the puzzle unfolds. Right, right. And I, you know, I don't know what you thought of it watching it a second time. I think the first time with the twists and turns would end up being the most enjoyable. But I think that there'd be a lot of interest in watching it a second time because you get a completely different experience yeah, and a completely different per- and a completely different perspective. Mm-hmm. So even though the twists and turns don't shock and surprise you you're still like, oh, wait, I see that from a completely different point of view, and that's interesting. And a lot of movies you just can't watch a second time, let alone even a first time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. right, because there was things that, uh, you know, the first time I watched it, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you might not pay attention to certain details, but then when you watch it a second time, those details really stand out as, you know, part of the whole uh, the whole overall plot. Yeah. Annabelle, do you have another question? Yeah, I have a little bit more. Uh, you say you know you've had you had like a rough a rough history, and you've worked with foster kids. I've I've worked with uh, kids in adolescent residential, and know kind of how things go for a lot of those kids. Those experiences, how do they add to your filmmaking? And do you feel like this is a pretty intense, rough movie at times? How how do you deal with the emotions that come up when you're when you're writing and, and creating a story like this? Uh, well, first of all, my hat is off to you, you know, because that, that's admirable work. I know how tough it is. And whether they live in with you or you're working in a residential facility, it's draining. And they always yes. say, oh, disconnect and don't take your work home. I mean, mm-hmm. they lived with me, so I had to take my work home. Um, but even if I've done residential care, too, and it, it's hard, especially yeah. when you see the real heartbreaking cases. Oh yeah. So you know, I, uh, you know, Neil had mentioned how did you sit around and think of what you would do? Uh, I worked with some um, very dangerous uh, sex offenders between the age of 15 and 21. Mm-hmm. You know, my family's been threatened. I've been through some really interesting situations, and uh, you know, just kind of in a passive aggressive way of threatening them. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I would say. Yeah, I'm going to get the potato peeler out, man. So that's where my <laughs> potato peeler comes in. But other than that, well, because, you know, they, I mean, a lot of these people do come back after certain people. Yeah. Um, but 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 I don't sit around fantasizing about how I'm going to kill people or what's good. But I try to put myself in the position of, okay, if somebody did do something horrific to someone I love, you know, what would I do? How far would I go? And, you know, I'm a real interesting case because I, I've, I've, I've never started a fight. I've always been a protector, and I mm-hmm. think that comes from my, my own abuse. 
because mm-hmm. I never wanted to, anybody to feel the way that I did. Uh, but a lot of people become abusers, yes. you know. But at the same time, being best friends with Rick and seeing the absolute cruelty, I mean, people, you know, picking on him and, you know, bumping into him and the names they'd call him and hey, Crip. And it, it's so devastating that, you know, then I would, I'd be ready to go. So yeah. um, I kind of, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't do anything, but I know, you know, that I've got it in me to do something. And, I, you know, I've raised everybody else's kids, and I've just gotten married and had my first child. And to really sit and think of if somebody hurt him, there, you know, I'm not a macho guy. If you met me, I'd hug you. I'm real easy going. But there's, I don't think there's anything, even my belief in God, as I understand it, that mm-hmm. could keep me. Once that mechanism kicks in, I, I don't think there's anything that could stop me. Um, I, I, I just don't think there is. And I don't think there's really anything wrong with that because people can do violent things. People have defended our country, you know, in war and gone back and, and raised their families and been honorable men. Um, but when you've got, you know, some real tyranny staring you in the face or injustice, mm-hmm. or to me, even more importantly, if somebody, and that's why I really went the extra mile to make sure, you know, I just hope to God I'm never, I'm never in that situation, you know, um, and have to experience that. But I did have the founding members of the Victims of Violent Crimes in Portland, Oregon. They established the chapter 26 years ago. Um, come to the set and they were so grateful and i mean seriously because you know this is a brutal movie but it wasn't just so much the, the the brutality it was it was what it did to them physically when their children got murdered and yeah. one of them you know was the, the parallels of the movie were, were, were freaky because i'd wrote it before i'd met the lady and you know just a long story short uh, my wife's sitting here on speakerphone. She can verify um, her and her husband had planned to kill the guy. And they oh, wow. bought a house. Yeah, they bought a house on the hill above him, took sniper rifle left lessons, wow. became shark shooters. And, and in the end, they just couldn't cross that bridge. Mm-hmm. And that's only because they figured that even if one of them did it, the other one would get caught and they had three other kids. Yeah. So there's, there's so much more to it about uh, it's not just I lost my child. It's 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 the anger and the, you know these, you got these soccer moms going to school and baking cookies and doing picnics, but they can turn into something completely different if something ferocious happens to a kid and and if they die, especially, you know, there's such a feeling of loss and the the, the destruction inside and the bitterness and the anger um, and and it's such a long road to find peace if you ever can at all. And, and that's what they were blown away with by the movie. And they brought pictures of their children. They brought pictures of the murderers. I couldn't believe it. You know, one got off and the other guy got life. Wow. Um, and, and just horrific uh, how they were killed. So anyway, you know, it's 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 been a real experience. Um, Was it ever fun. hard for you to, uh, to get into that mindset while you're filming the movie, to get into the character? Um. No, well, see, here I'd go giving away the film. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I mean, there, there were there were moments, um, there were moments, but again, I was so concerned for Michael Baldwin's safety and all the things I was doing to him um, that my mo- I didn't one hundred percent dive into the character because I was so concerned about safety. Um, so thank God, because I really wouldn't want to go there. If I didn't have to, and I mean, I was certainly there uh, during the take, but then you know, right before, right after, you know, it, it was gone. It wasn't anything that hung with me. Thank goodness. Mm-hmm. Now I, I know. You, what was that? I was going to say if you if you watch the behind the scenes featurette that's on yep. my website uh, at thedocinternationalfilms dot com, you'll see Michael Baldwin and I interacting. I'm smiling. I'm li- I'm always smiling. I'm always happy. You uh-huh. know. So, so uh, to see brutal compared to who I really am is 
I didn't. I didn't. Uh, it didn't stay with me. Yeah. You know? I, I actually but brought I, this up to him because I didn't know it was the same person when you first contacted me because you look so much different uh, than you do in the movie. Yes. Well, that you know. That's, that's a that's good thing. That's good. Yeah. 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 It is. Uh, if you contacted I, 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 me and you were, you know, this big uh, guy covered in blood and a mask, I think, you know, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will I will tell you that uh, after shooting one day, um, the, well, certain scenes we filmed at one house. I don't want to give it away. Other scenes, the basement scenes, we filmed at another house that were kitty cornered to each other. Mm-hmm. So I was staying over at the other house, so I would cross the street. Well, I pass people every day for over a week, covered in blood, just you know, <laughs> looked like a, an atrocity, and nobody ever called the cops. Nobody <laughs> did anything uh-huh. until until the second to the last day when the mailman saw me and he called the police. Said this huge guy covered in blood just came out of this house, and anyway, three cop cars showed up, a canine unit. They surrounded the house. I wasn't there. The poor guy that owned the house was there. And anyway, you know, it was real interesting. So uh, uh, that all turned out okay, but he had to show him the script. I mean, it, it was quite a process for him to uh, – but I'm glad I wasn't there. They'd have pulled all their guns out. <laughs> and I'd be like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know? Hmm. Now, I'm a big fan of the wheel in the movie. Okay. <laughs> now uh, – now, each each one of those things on the wheel, did you film any of those that, that they might not have uh, clicked on or thought about filming, any of those that you didn't click on? Um, yes, but, um, you know, there, there's only so much, I think, torture that somebody can handle. <laughs> right, right. Um, and me, meaning the audience. And I think what we gave them was, was plenty, and that's why, um, you know, and also time and, uh, and effects being a cost. Uh, I, I mean, some of the, the things I came up with were fantastic but and, and just absolutely gruesome and, again, never seen in a film, which is big for me. I hate when you just see the same thing over and over. Uh, but, but, you know, when we sat down with the, and, and broke, broke down the budget for each effect, I mean, one of them was, you know, 2500 bucks. So mm-hmm. um, I actually had a, a power drill that was going to drill through the lens of his glass go into his eye and pull his eyeball out. Hmm. So, <laughs> you know, um, that was one of them. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop with that one. My <laughs> wife's chuckling. Uh, but I had, you know, I had some pretty vicious stuff. But I, I think what they have is, is good enough. And I think that, honestly, in, in, in retrospect, would have been over the top, um, especially considering where the movie went. So I, I just think it was divine intervention and everything worked out the way it was supposed to. Um, and it wasn't so far gone that it was unbelievable that the movie went to where it did. Um, you know, if you know what I mean, I, I don't want to say anymore, yeah. but, um, you know, so, but, uh, you know, that's why the wheel spinning uh, was, you know, it'd land and then you cut away and it'd be like, that's why he'd be such a bloody mess because, I'd show you one thing, but then, as you noticed, it'd land on two or three others. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I wasn't going to show all that. So he just got progressively bloodier and messed up as he went. Mm-hmm. You mentioned your wife a couple times. What was her uh, thoughts on, on on the movie when she saw it, or did she see it? <laughs> Have you seen it, honey? Yeah, too many times. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I, I, I don't think she's actually sat down and watched the whole thing. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, my wife is a, a very loving, wonderful soul and didn't understand why I was writing it in the beginning. She has no interest in the, in the movie business and, um, you know, is, is very active at church and, um, you know, in her community and doing volunteer work. And so here I am writing this, you know, brutal film. But to me, that was only a part of it that really did establish more of the character, but the rest of it to me is all story. So I wasn't focused on the violence. I was focused on everything you, else that you already know is in the film. So as it started to unfold, she started to get that more and more. And my father was the same way. 
because, you know, I mean, I've been writing songs for a long time. I've written 12 children's books. I got my first one coming out in November. I've had two published now, um, and the second one's coming out in April. So it's like, you know, you, you write all this really nice, beautiful, cute stuff. What are you doing this for? And I said, well, you know, I mean, they understood the Haunted Caves because the way it was written, even though it is terrifying and bloody, is PG-13, and it's really kind of the ultimate, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's good versus evil, um, which, you know, is always a kind of stand up on your feet and cheer for it type of thing, um, not just the graphic violence. But this one is obviously violent. I mean, this one obviously is rated R. This one is, is pretty brutal. But um, as the story unfolded, they really got behind it. And, um, you know, now they see, especially when the, the founding members of the Victims of Violent Crimes came out, they, they hugged me and they were both bawling and they wouldn't let go of me. It was the most mm -hmm. unbelievable experience. To have that kind of support because I'd written something from their point of view, uh, and they didn't they didn't mind at all about the violence because they had all all those thoughts themselves. So mm -hmm. they just didn't carry it out. So uh, right now, where we stand, everybody's completely supportive and very proud of me. But there were some real moments where they weren't sure what I was doing. <laughs> you know. Now, um, I won't give it away, but there's uh, a couple uh, scenes in the movie that kind of, I actually access to the earlier to uh, Michael, and um, he told me to ask you. Was uh, I thought maybe it was supposed to kind of look like kind of a Christ figure at one point? Is is that in the movie at all, or is it just something uh, I kind of dreamt up? Uh, kind of like the scar on the head, and then the, almost like the um, kind of thought made me think of. Uh, Crown of Thorns, and then also with, with the nails kind of thought, made me think of uh, Crucifixion. Oh, well, you know, a couple other people had thought of that, and that, that, wasn't, uh, that was not even a thought in my mind, um, to be honest with you. Um, my thought was, I mean, here the guy's tied to the chair. He's chained to the chair. He's handcuffed to the chair. Uh, he's really completely bound. But how's he going to get out? How's he going to escape? So to take that a step further, you know, you throw that gag in there, and then you're like, oh, my God, you know, he ain't going anywhere. I mean, this this guy's done. But then it's like, well, there's got to be more stories, so i got to hang in there and see. So, no, I didn't think of that at all. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, I, I've had the same comments a few times about the crown of thorns. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, any uh, progress in uh, getting distributed for the film? Uh, well, we, we've had offers. Um, we we uh, just won most terrifying film at the Crypticon um, Film Festival. So that's in Kansas, and Michael will be there, and I'll be there, and he'll be introducing the film, and then him and I are going to do a Q&A afterwards. So uh, I don't want him introducing me first because I don't want him to see this, you know, big, nice, likable, bloody guy, which is really what I am because then I'm afraid they won't be afraid of me in the film and I want them to be um, so then they'll all come out after the film um, but uh, uh, and then that's on Friday night the 23rd and then Friday the 25th um, the president of Rue Morgue was so impressed with it that they're going to they, they made a slot for it at Rue Morgue you know which is huge yeah. in Toronto so I'll be going up there um, so you know we've got We've got distributors interested, and I've, I've never been down this road before, um, and, I, and I have had some offers, some money up front, some no money up front, bigger percentage on the back end, but I've heard a lot of horror stories about distributors. I'm sure there's some good, honest ones out there, um, but I'm, I'm also thinking of self-distributing. Um, I have met some people that would financially back me in that. Uh, Alan has been talking to... Uh, and I have been talking to also uh, Regal uh, for a theatrical release, also Rave Cinemas for a smaller theatrical release. Um, so we're we're kind of seeing where it's going to go, but we're running out of time because it'd, like, it'd be nice to make Halloween. Um, yeah. But in the end, I may end up just doing it myself or or or, or just selling it on DVD because theatrical is a real pain. I mean, everybody wants that, but I I just want to make films you know i'm not uh, uh gonna sell my mother and swap everything i have to make it in this business i mean i love movies i always have 
Uh, they were a form of escape for me through my troubled situation as a child. Um, I really connect to them. They really move me. Um, but I, you know, I'd rather just do it the way I want to do it or not do it. And that's not from a, an egotistical, I know best point of view. It's just I'm 43 years old. Life is short. Um, I don't want to play a bunch of games with people, you know. So, anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, hopefully the right people will be brought into my space and we'll all fall together. You mentioned a few times about uh, troubled childhood. Did you want to expand on that, or would you rather just leave it at that? Uh, well, you know, um, basically what I said before, I'll just leave it with, uh, you know, my folks got divorced, and, and, and we were a more well-to-do family. Um, my my father was very successful building uh, mobile home parks and the vice president of a wholesale distributing company. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, we were, we lived in a nice neighborhood, and I was the first person anybody had ever heard of to have a pinball machine and a shuffleboard table. Uh, and, you know, I had such a wonderful life, and my father was so wonderful that when, when everything went to pot and my parents got divorced, that's what made it so tough because I'd had it so good, you know. And then uh, certain people came into my life, and it just wasn't a good situation at all. So um, I'll pretty much leave it at that. But it's that's I thank God for my best friend Rick and learning that compassion because I had been putting his shoes on, uh, you know, since I can remember and helping him and and you know taking care of him and, and and people used to come up to me and go oh, you're such a nice guy or is he your brother and and really the honest got truth i'm not boasting about myself at all i am the lucky one i am the privileged one he taught me so much and when you're best friends with somebody and you don't have to cross those boundaries of dressing dressing somebody bathing somebody putting their shoes on it brings you so much closer and when you see other people teasing them and picking on them, um, it's it, 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 for me it was quite I, I couldn't understand it because I was very lucky to see the person that was there and not his deformity, um, you know. And so I I I never wanted to make anybody. I was certainly angry. I mean, especially when I got later on, and these people, you know, to this day are are nervous because. They, I'm a big guy, man, and I'm I'm tough and I'm strong, and they still know they got it coming, and I've made that clear to them. But they they uh, you know they're 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 in hiding basically, <laughs> and, and I wish I could have a relationship, but they're just not capable of doing that. So I I just never wanted to, uh, and, and it's not that I would do anything. It's just uh, I think that the guilt has has eaten them up and. You know, I'm not sure, but I just want to help people. You know, my door is always open if somebody's willing to um, apologize. And all those apologies have been made. I want to make that clear. But it's just easier for them to kind of hide off into their world, I think, because it was was very very dramatic, um, you know. So I, I, I personally could not ever live with doing something like that. To someone, I, I don't even like being rude to somebody, or you know, so I, I don't know how they live with what they've done. But so maybe that's why they they live the way they do now. I don't know, but um, anyway, just made me more of a protector, uh, totally instead of an abuser. And I think you you go either way when you go through that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, I've seen the uh, you know several reviews of the film, all been really positive. Um, the people that you've shown it to and the reviews, uh, what has been uh, you know everyone's response been? Well, you know, it, it, everything has been incredible so far. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've had some from, from some real filmmakers and some distributors that I've met that are cool and honest. You know, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time. We didn't have a lot of money. I have received quite a bit of, 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 uh, positive, constructive, negative, if that makes sense. Uh, criticism on on quite a few of the shots, but at the same time, they've told me that the story is so incredible and nothing they've ever seen, and that Michael's performance is so unbelievable, and that it's just compelling that they made allowances 
for lack of direction or lack of, you know, shot or lighting. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, and I'm open to anything. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm no Spielberg. I'm just, I'm learning as I go. I've never been behind a camera in my life or, you know, and again, certainly co-directing, uh, having differences of opinions and things like that. So, you know, I'm open to everything. I've been really surprised at everyone's reactions about my, uh, my performance, uh, seriously, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always struggled with self-esteem and it's been very nice to hear the compliments people have given me. Um, but it's weird, you know, watching yourself or hearing your own voice. I've never liked my voice. Um, and I'm so, you know, focused on Michael Baldwin and his incredible performance. If I would have gotten somebody else that did a very weak job and you know what he had to do, it's, a, it's amazing what he did. Um, and I believe that that makes me look so much better. And if I would have had somebody that couldn't have carried that role, then it would have made me look worse, you know, by far worse. So I think that, you know, his acting made me look by far better because he's just so dynamic in the part. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again, the, the website itself is brutalmovie.net. And if uh, anybody wanted to contact you, you know, how, how would they go about that? Go on the website or would you, uh, want to contact you on Facebook? Well, they can contact me on Facebook or they can contact me at uh, zadokinternationalfilms.com. Um, my phone number and my email address is on there. So mm -hmm. that's a good way to get a hold of me. Yeah, we'll put that up on the website. Well, I'll put your number up there. We'll put the information out of contact you there. But, okay. Uh, we really want to thank you for coming on. And I really want to thank you for having me. Thank you for having uh, Michael and Alan and, 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 you know, letting the whole crew come on. I was stuck in traffic, so I didn't get to hear what they said. But as a fan of both of them, I can't wait. And I'm just very, very appreciative of, of you giving us the time. Thank you very much. And for your interest and your compliments. Yeah, and thank you, uh, thank you for hooking everybody up. And, uh, I really think everyone should, uh, you know, seek out the movie and, uh, wish you all the luck in getting it, you know, out there for everyone to see. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Cool. This is Kyle Gass of Tenacious D. You're listening to Without Your Head. All right, this is Julian Nitzberg on WithoutYourHead.com, and I think they're talking about the head of your penis, as far as I understand.